Nomine Patris, Fili, Spiritus Sancti. Amen. Ave Maria, gratia plena, Dominus tecum. Benedicta tu in mulieribus, et benedictus fructus ventris tui, Jesus. Sancta Maria, Mater Dei, ora pro nobis peccatoribus, nunc et in ora mortis nostre. Amen. In nomine Patris, et Fidi, Spiritus Sancti. Amen. Brethren in Christ, laudator Jesus Christus. Welcome to Meaning of Catholic, the Lay Apostolate. And I'm joined today by my friend and colleague, Dr. Jennifer Bryson. Dr. Bryson, it's a joy and an honor to have you on the show today. I'm delighted to be here. Uh, Dr. Bryson, if you don't know her, she is, uh, I can't remember, I was trying to think of if we met through 1 Peter 5, or if it was um, first through Meaning of Catholic, I don't recall. But um, Dr. Bryson is a PhD in Greco-Arabic and Islamic studies from Yale. And she is currently translating the works of Catholic author Ida Friedrich Gores, if I'm saying that German correctly, from yes. German to English. And that's that's an exciting project. We'll have to touch on that as well. And she lives in Heiligengreitz, Austria. But you're actually an American by birth, right? Yes. Wonderful. Well, happy Fourth of July to you in, in uh, as an expatriate. Yes. <laughs> you, you get together with uh, the Americans and, and celebrate the Fourth of July in Austria. What do you do? Well, in the town I'm in, I only know of one other American. Um, he is a Benedictine uh, monk who is studying at the theology school here in Heiligenkreuz. Uh, but he's out of town this week. So. Oh, okay. <laughs> I remember because I, I thought of, um, I, I remember I was I was living in Egypt uh, in, two, what was it, 2007? And uh, it was just, it was the 4th of July. And, and we had to celebrate the 4th of July with a bunch of Americans. It was great. It's great to do it uh, in Egypt. It just felt felt more homesick at the time. Um, but that brings up the first thing I wanted to ask you about was your dissertation, because um, I don't know what you what you call. You don't call, you know, Franco files study and love Frank French culture. And I study and I've always been fascinated, fascinated by Islamic culture. And I studied Arabic. That's why I went to Egypt. Um, but I wouldn't say I'm an Islamophile. Uh, I Rather, quite the opposite, in fact. But um, tell us about your dissertation, Greco, Arabic, and Islamic studies from Yale. Yeah. So I actually got into Arabic and Islamic studies unusually, not via Islam, which is how most of the Westerners and Americans I know, sort of their point of entry, but rather through Thomas Aquinas. Um, I had done my master's degree in medieval European intellectual history. And um, as I got to the later part, and was studying and began to learn about the translation and transmission of Aristotle and other Greek thinkers out of Arabic into Latin, and it caused a lot of intellectual upheaval in Europe, I thought, oh, this is interesting. Um, and so I left um, what I was doing and went to study Arabic and then did my PhD. Wow, that's that's fascinating. So I I, I remember I was, I was introduced to Aristotle actually through Avicenna and Averroes in a college um, so what exactly did you, um, what was your focus on uh, in your dissertation on that topic? So my dissertation was on a medical text on brain, nerve, and mental disorders um, wow. from the early 900s. And the medical text itself is a huge encyclopedia that covers everything from head to toe. But because I started in book one, which is the head, it's brain, nerve, and mental disorders. And um, I looked at how this author was using his Greek sources because he his book is an anthology of every medical text he could find on every topic. And the book was one of two, the, the two major, um, really the two almost only medical textbooks in Europe for a few hundred years. Oh, OK. So it was the original language Greek and then it was translated into Arabic and then translated into Latin? No, even more complicated than that. Okay. The book was written in Arabic. But it was an anthology of sources that had mostly been translated into Arabic, primarily from Greek, although many of those were translated from Greek to Syriac to Arabic, only yes. some from Greek to Arabic. Okay. Um, he had a few sources from India and Persia. And then his book in Arabic was translated into Latin. I see. That's fantastic. Now, let me ask you one more obscure question about this, because um, something that the, the, the woke 
universities try to say is that the Arabs taught the Europe, you know, the, the Muslims taught Europe philosophy. We didn't, we were so stupid. We didn't understand that. And the Andalusian paradise created this revival. Uh, but the reality is that the Syriac Christians, as you just mentioned, who were under Persian domination in the Mohammedans of the East, they took Aristotle and translated it into Arabic. And that's how they even got Aristotle in the first place. Um, so can you comment at all on the Syriac involvement in this whole chain of uh, so it was actually when the Arabs came north as Islam was spreading, they encountered a learned culture in um, the areas to the north today, generally what we would call Syria and um, Iraq. And um, rather than trying to destroy what they found, they realized, wow, this would be useful for us. Um, and so they began to commission translations from Syriac into Arabic because it was the Syriac speakers who knew Greek and who had begun assembling libraries. That's interesting. It's, it's just a whole nother aspect of history, the Persian Empire and all this other stuff. So with all of that, uh, Latin, this is this is our Latin study group. I didn't even talk about the lay apostolate, but um, this whole uh, conversation uh, with Dr. Bryson wanted to make sure everybody got to know you a little bit before we talk about what we're talking about. Um, and that is this Latin study group. Um, what made you want to start this group, Dr. Bryson? So I, um, you know, a, a lot of people have come to the traditions of the Catholic Church, especially the traditional Latin mass in recent years. But for me, that was round two. Um, I had first begun going to the traditional Latin mass in the late 80s, early 90s. But um, I, I was brand new, just coming into the church and the people seemed really angry. And I couldn't figure out why the priest some of them would mumble the Latin instead of speak it. Uh, and so I just didn't get it, although I was very attracted. So then a few decades later, I started going to the traditional Latin mass again and finally found the church that I had entered into decades before and discovered that um, I really began to realize that I had an incredible luxury in having studied Latin before and that I already had you know, at least medium grasp of Latin and was able to enjoy some of the treasures that are in these texts. And I had friends who were new to the traditional Latin mass who only had a little bit of Latin, you know, many years ago, like in elementary school, because here in Austria where I live, they teach it, still teach it sometimes, or they didn't know any Latin. And um, while Latin is not necessary to understand in the traditional Latin mass, you know, children often have a more profound, intuitive understanding of it than people who are looking at the texts. Um, still, it's really helpful. Um, and so I wanted to do something to help those who have some familiarity with Latin, but don't feel they have time to take a formal course to get into the texts of the church more. And I also wanted to find others who were at my, I would say, intermediate level who want to spend some time looking more closely at some texts so we can all be improving our Latin. Excellent. Yeah. I'm really excited for the group. Now, uh, more about you a little bit. Did you, you said coming in the church, are you a convert or were you raised Catholic? I came into the church while I was in graduate school at Yale. Wow. Great. So Yale, Yale fostered a conversion. I thought Yale was a godless woke university. I, I was wrong about that. Tell me well, about my that. My initial conversion was at a place that was even more radical than Yale. Yes, that's possible. Um, at the Karl Marx University in East Germany. Wow. Um, I studied when I was a sophomore in college while well, it was still East Germany. Um, and I, while studying Marxism, Leninism there, I um, had God break into my life one day while I was reading an essay by Lenin on um, why atheism is a sine qua non of Marxism. Well, could, could you just elaborate on that a little bit? So you, Len, you were reading Lenin. Uh, so were you an atheist then? Were you, were you interested in Marxism because you were an atheist? Tell us more about your conversion. So I, I gone to a Lutheran church. My mother took to a Lutheran, mainline Lutheran church as a child. Um, I didn't like it because I got in trouble. Um, 
you know, for asking questions in Sunday school. Um, so by the time I went to college, I was a person of no religion at all. I was really an early nun. And um, also, you know, being at university, I was proud of that. You know, the smart people don't need religion. In other words, I was a foolish teenager. Uh -huh. um, and so then my sophomore year of college, I spent the whole year in East Germany. Um, I had already been in Austria before that in high school, so I knew German. And um, I early, right at the beginning, a student asked me, are you a Marxist? And I said to him, I don't know enough about Marxism to say that I am. And I also don't know enough about Marxism to say that I'm not. Um, so I decided while I was there to enroll in what was for the full-time students, the mandatory six semester Marxism Leninism core. Wow. Um, and the philosophy so is, course was the foundation wow. of it all. This is communist occupied East Germany, basically. Uh, this is like post-Soviet oh. or post-war Soviet yeah. East Germany. Wow. The Leipzig train station where I lived, because it's militarily very strategic, uh, was full of uh, Soviet soldiers. Wow. Man. So you're, you're in a, so you learned about, so you encountered uh, Marxism, you were researching Marxism in a Soviet satellite state. And how did and you, and tell us about how you encountered God by reading Lenin. So it was about six to eight weeks into the course. As I said, philosophy was the absolute foundation. It was not an economic system. This was a worldview that started with the study of materialism. We studied ancient Greek materialism and then skipped straight from there to Feuerbach because nothing happened in philosophy in between. Ha ha. Yes. And um, studied then Feuerbach's um, Marx, Engels, Lenin. And it was a great philosophy course with primary source texts. And so about six to eight weeks in, we got to the topic of atheism itself and why you cannot have Marxism without atheism. And at this point, I'm becoming more and more interested and in realizing like, this is a major claim about reality. If this is true, I need to find out. So I was fascinated and I studied super intensely for the course. And one day sitting in the reading room of the Karl Marx University uh, in 1986, I was reading this essay by Lenin to prepare for class and I, I God broke into my life. Um, and I, um, I knew in that instant that I have a creator and God is the creator. And it was also a very intimate experiencing experience of knowing God as my creator. It wasn't an intellectual concept. And uh, that moment changed my life. And wow. the Polish students that year were my best friends. So I was quite anti-Catholic. But they were phenomenal, fearless, profoundly faithful. And I knew that my experience in the library had something to do with their faith. So it wow. took a while, but I figured that out, that connection. Wow, amazing. So you were introduced to the Latin Mass, um, in, you said the 90s, so shortly after. Yeah, um, so late 80s, early 90s. Yeah. And then I, I started studying Latin as I was coming into the Catholic Church while I was studying medieval European intellectual history. Um, that was also at Yale. Mm -hmm. And um, yeah, I, I was like a child in a candy store that year coming into the church, studying Latin, St. Augustine, Thomas Aquinas. I, it felt like I was spent the year opening up a treasure chest. Wow. And Latin was part of the one of my tools to be able to enjoy that treasure chest. Also, I've traveled a lot, so I've really come to appreciate how important it is for the church to have a universal language. Mm -hmm. um, and we can help unite the body of Christ um, when Catholics can share that universal language of Latin in the Roman Rite. Excellent. Well, one, one last question before we delve deeper into Latin and the study group, and that is, can you tell us about Ida Friederike Gores? Yeah. Yeah, Ida Friederike Gores, whose name is very hard to pronounce in English. Uh, I'm translating her works right now from German into English. Some were translated already in the 1930s. Christopher Dawson knew about her. Um, Christopher Dawson, Frank Sheed were involved in publishing her in the 30s. Um, she's a fabulous, fabulous Catholic author who lived from 1901 to 1971. And she's in German-speaking Europe almost entirely forgotten today 
I'm, I live here next to a huge Cistercian monastery next to a theology school. And even here, uh, almost nobody is familiar with her. At most, a few people like they've heard the name, but they don't know her. Uh, because in the late 1960s and then 1971, when she died, she was exactly the kind of voice that the 1968 revolution didn't want to hear. Um, so I've, I've just been incredibly excited to discover her. And um, she spent her whole life as an author. She and her husband weren't able to have children. And so she wrote a lot. Um, so that which has been translated into English is only a small part of her work. And her most famous book is available in English, and it is her biography of St. Therese of Lisieux wow. um, called Hidden Face, and that's published by Ignatius Press. Wow. Okay. Uh, so it sounds like she's uh, kind of an Edith Stein character in the sense of uh, a female German intellectual writer cutting edge uh can you tell us a little i mean is she like anti-feminist like the yes. second wave yeah. or the and, let's see. um she, so she like, loved yeah. the church and loved the traditions of the church um and a german scholar who wrote a critical book of feminist theology comments in his book that there and he's commenting on german um speaking female catholic authors he said there there are, there are catholic profound catholic voices in the church in the modern era who aren't feminists, but they their voices are ignored. And it's a group of them. And he mentions Gertrude von Lefort, Edith Stein, and Ida Friederike Gürtis um, all together and a few others. So she's she's part of that mid-20, early to mid-20th century group of um fabulous Catholic female writers. Wow, that's well, that's really exciting. So what's the what do you what do you think is going to be the first publication in English of her work? Tell us about that. Uh, so in, in this new round of interest in her, 50 years after nothing had uh, been translated, the first book coming out this fall will come out from Clooney Media, and it's called The Church in the Flesh. She wrote it in 1950. It is incredibly relevant today, and it's a set of six letters. So letters more as a literary genre, uh, not actual letters she wrote. Um, to Catholics who are bewildered and increasingly troubled in their faith, who think that they have to get with the times. They got They need to be, you know, modern people and adopt modern ideas. And doing so is eroding their faith. And so she addresses six fabulous letters to them about core components of the faith. Um, and uh, Cardinal Leo Shevtsik, um, who was a, a well-known, uh, one of the more conservative German cardinals um, back in the 1990s before he was cardinal, wrote a forward to the 1994 um, republication of this book. And back then he said, this book is amazingly relevant today. Um, and so again, in 2023, 20, it still is. And I'm excited that will come out. After that, I've already published, uh, translated a biography she wrote of St. John Henry Newman, two books on marriage, um, and um, there's some others in the works. Awesome. That's very exciting. Uh, I'm very, as a Hildebrandian, I'm very interested in this particular period of German Catholicism <laughs> that you discuss. Um, so uh, you mentioned, already mentioned a few other things about Latin, but... Um, when I think about Latin and the importance of Latin for the church, it, it I think about the the three languages that Pontius Pilate put on the cross of our Lord, mm -hmm. namely Hebrew, Greek, and Latin, which um, uh, another Germanophile, uh, E. Michael Jones, makes a comment and says, "This is a this ends up being a prophecy of the universality of the church." And I think that those three languages, in particular, um, are sacred in the sense that they form the cultural basis of Christendom. Those three and and no less, because uh, sometimes Latin exclusively or even Latin and Greek and Hebrew gets excluded, but it's always been those three. But Latin in particular has this special place because it's sort of this Hebrew is is sort of this the heart, the revelation, uh, very much focusing on the heart of, of man, the heart of God in the Hebrew scriptures. And then we have the Greek philosophical metaphysical tradition and all of the speculation and beauty of that but then latin kind of comes in and takes the first two and sort of 
systematizes them, orders them, creates this whole administrative um, sort of this this practical philosophy, this sort of Romanitas of the Romans, which creates um, Christendom out of that and the importance of Latin. Um, I think when you look at the Eastern Orthodox churches and all of their divisions and all the different divisions in the East, you see what the loss of Latin is. And we're kind of we're kind of seeing what it looks like with the loss of Latin, because we've just had a loss of Latin in the Roman church. Uh, yeah. So now we have these insane divisions everywhere. Nobody can figure out. We've got encyclicals being written in 12 languages, but not Latin. So we can't figure out the footnote. What does it even mean? And so any more comments on why is it so important to study Latin? Um, so again, this universal language of the church, when I lived in Cairo for two years, um, I noticed that I counted about 16 different languages um, in which one had the option of, of going to Catholic mass in any of these, but 16. And this meant in Cairo, 16 separate communities that had no contact with each other at all. Um, and many people have seen this in their own parishes, for example, in the US where there might be an English language uh, mass and a Spanish language mass, you end up almost with two parishes in the parish. Also, Latin is not only the language of our traditional liturgy and the mass of the ages, which is in and of itself a treasure, it's also a language of prayer. Um, and so the first topic that we're going to start with in the Latin group are the prayers of the rosary. That, that's that's a really great illustration. I didn't know you spent time in El Cajera. Oh, that's yes. wonderful. I uh, did, you, did you visit the uh, Holy Family churches with the miracles of the Holy Family? Or did you yes. visit uh, Mokatam, the garbage, the cave churches? Yes, uh, not the cave churches. When I was in Mokatam, I visited uh, Mother Teresa's nuns who oh, uh, were there. Oh, yeah. And I when I lived that. in Cairo, I attended a Melkite Rite church. So it was also a broadening of my horizons in the Catholic Church. Excellent. I think I went to that same, what was it the old people's home that they run there? It's like a, was that the one? Because uh, I've been to one have, of those in Cairo too. They had one of those in Cairo, more in the city. And then in Mokata, which is in the garbage dump area, um, they had a home for orphans and some others. Oh, okay. That's, what year were you, were you there? 91 Ooh. to 93. Okay. Okay, that I, I was there in 2007. Wow, that's great. I, I didn't even realize we both went to Cairo too. Wonderful. Uh, um, so yeah, but that what you just said that just illustrates how much uh, universal language is needed um, when they have 16 separate communities, especially in a Muslim country where there's domination of Mohammedans. Um, and uh, I this is a part of a our our lay apostolate with meaning of Catholic. Um, because I think it's very, very important that parents and children learn Latin. Uh, not only you just mentioned all these, I mean, the great things about the Latin mass, and that's especially good for parents, but children learning Latin so important so that we can pass down our tradition. Yeah. Uh, and some, I mean, we've, how many texts are in Latin, which will never really be translated because there's just so many of them. You know, there's hundreds and hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of texts in Latin. Um, you know, we, we need to be able to access those texts. But even today, um, I remember hearing um, from a Vatican uh, insider who, who, went, who was studied in the Vatican in the 70s. And the uh, language of instruction was German in the Vatican. It was no longer Latin. Latin was just gone. It's just sort of evaporated immediately. Um, so I think that teaching our kids Latin is something that trad parents today or Catholic parents in general, I think this, this is a duty to just preserve Latin, even if it's just something small. Yep. Um, any comments on the transmission of Latin, generationally speaking? Well, also one of the reasons to learn Latin and one of the great tools for parents, I encourage you, is Latin hymns. There are fabulous hymns in our Catholic tradition. Um, and singing is one of the best ways to learn a language. Um, so during Lent this year, I chose a few 
hymns in German and in Latin, and my Lenten undertaking uh, was to memorize them. Um, and so I, I have a, a Latin hymn I'm learning now, and I sing it every morning as part of my prayers. Um, wow. And a really important thing about learning Latin for those who are new to Latin is you will never learn Latin only by looking at ink on a page or looking at pixels on a screen. Um, it's incredibly helpful and it will make learning Latin easier if you use it, speak out loud, listen to it, sing it, write it. And that's another reason to, that we're starting the Latin study group with the rosary um, is that we're going to combine studying and looking at the prayers of the rosary for half an hour, followed by actually praying the rosary together in Latin. That's fantastic. I, I, I'm so glad you brought that up because um, in our in our house, we do the four Marian hymns in Latin throughout the year. And our, our parish is blessed to keep the custom of uh, chanting that hymn at the end of the Latin mass. Um, and you're you're absolutely right. And those particular Marian hymns are are particularly beautiful and mysterious um, because of the melodic structure of these. And they're not like hymns; they're like almost like Greek antiphons in terms of their structure, not uh, the metrical form. So uh, yeah, I love what you said. Uh, so uh, this is this is wonderful. I'm so excited for this group. So this is going to be this beginning this Saturday at 11 a.m. Eastern time. Um, so here you can click the link below. This is the uh, where you go. So you click on this link right here. Join the study group. So tell us about tell us more about the group. Yeah. So it'll start on um, Saturday, July eighth, and we're in the year twenty twenty three. In case anybody's coming across this podcast later on, um, and it'll be from eleven. The Latin study part will be from eleven to eleven thirty Eastern. Um, followed from 11.30 to noon by the rosary in Latin. And I set it up to make it as easy and accessible as possible. So only a half hour of study, studying Latin together, which means if you're busy and you think, oh, you know, I don't know if I have time for this today, you know, it's only half an hour. And people are welcome to join us for the half hour study time or just for the rosary at 11.30 or for both. You'll notice on the screen here, um, the cost is zero. Um, and so we're going to offer this for free for those who are members of the Meaning of Catholic Guild. Yeah. And also, oh, a, a quick note about level. Um, I, we had sent out a survey of interest ahead of time, and there was much more interest than I had expected from those who are, I would say, medium beginners to advanced beginner. Um, I had initially expected this might be a small group of maybe three to five, six people reading intermediate level texts, um, but there was so much interest. We had 35 people respond to the survey um, and so much interest from mid-level beginners that we're going to include both um, medium to advanced beginner levels um, as well as intermediate level. Um, so to give an example of that, on the first day, on July 8th, we're going to um, look at the Ave Maria closely. While many people may know it, it's an opportunity since they know it to look at some of the grammar. And then also, we're going to look at the clauses, and we'll explain in a moment what those are for those who aren't familiar, um, from... Um, a method of praying the Latin um, from St. Louis de Montfort. And in those three clauses on faith, hope, and love, for example, there's three um, subjunctive verbs. So there'll be something there for, for all the levels and the intermediate level folks, I'm hoping will want to jump in more and helping everybody else learn Latin. This is a lay apostolate and we're lay people helping each other. Um, the topics we're going to cover that you have here on the screen, I intentionally put the prayers that are repeated in the rosary first. So July 8th, the Ave Maria, July 15th, the, um, Our Father, July 22nd, the Fatima prayer. And then um, in the rest of it, we'll get into other texts such as the Salve Regina. We'll go through the um, clauses um, in Latin for the glorious, the sorrowful, and the um, joyful mysteries. 
Anne will also um, go through those for the Luminous Mysteries um, as an opportunity to reflect on scripture. We'll look at the St. Michael prayer one week and then two weeks on the creed. Awesome. Fantastic. Uh, I, I remember actually when, um, speaking of singing it, um, when I was at the CIC conference um, in Pittsburgh last year, mm -hmm. My favorite moment of the entire conference was when it was at the high mass with Bishop Snyder and we sang the creed and just hundreds of people sang the creed all together. It was like, even at, even at my own parish, um, not everybody's singing. It was, it was kind of like everybody was singing with German gusto. I I've heard the Germans sing the high mass, uh, strongly. I don't know if that, is that true? I've heard of that. Um, well, you're actually bringing back a memory for me that comes to the year I came into the church. Um, I went to a, a unicorn Novus Ordo parish in New Haven, Connecticut, that was um, run by some Dominicans there, um, in which it was a Novus Ordo mass in English, but we sang the Gloria and the, the Credo and the Sanctus Agnus Dei in Latin, and everybody sang the creed. And that's how I learned um, the creed in Latin and everybody sang it. And so now when the creed isn't sung, I feel like ah, a little disappointed. <laughs> yeah. I love it. Yeah. It's nothing like credo, credo three. I, I love credo three. Yeah. Um, so, singing oh, it ahead. internalized it in me. So. Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. It's, it's, I, I love what you said about singing. I think that's absolutely correct. My, my children certainly can sing uh, some of these Latin hymns and they don't even know exactly what all the grammar is but that's okay getting it first singing that's yeah. like such a great way to learn um so tell us about um the montfortian clauses so these will be familiar to many listeners but for those who aren't familiar to help understand what we're going to be doing in the class is um these are clauses um that help to um articulate what we're praying for. This is for the five mysteries, um, you know, within within each set of the rosary. And then also at the beginning when we pray for faith, hope, and love. And these are short clauses that come in the middle of the Hail Mary. So for example, um, Hail Mary, full of grace, the Lord is with you, thee. Blessed art thou among women and blessed is the fruit of thy womb, Jesus who increases our faith. Or an example would be from the joyous mysteries, um, blessed is the fruit of thy womb, Jesus, whom you presented in the temple. And then the response follows, Holy Mary, mother of God, pray for us sinners now and at the hour of our death, amen. So we'll be learning the, the prayers and then all of those clauses that go in between for all of the mysteries um, as well as the three phrases at the beginning on faith, hope, and love, we'll be learning those in Latin. And repeating those in Latin is also um, a great way to work on even more Latin. Yeah, I remember um, actually my my Latin teacher in college. Um, what what he his his method was to bang on the desk. He hi hike. Who he is, who he is, who he is. And we would just conjugate through and he would just, it was a, <laughs> so uh, this is much more pious, uh, much more pious exercise, but the importance of saying it, even if you're not singing it, saying something audibly yes, um, for, absolutely. as a pedagogical method. Um, so let me just finish your PowerPoint here. So um, do you want to, you want me to click through this and explain? Go ahead. Sure. Go ahead and explain. This is the last slide. All right, great. So uh, this Saturday, so this Saturday, 11 a.m. Eastern time. So that's 8 a.m. Pacific and everything in between. You are in Central European time. So all of our European times, I don't know if, if you're a Aussie or a Kiwi, I always get confused if it's 11 hours or 12 hours ahead, but uh, oh, go ahead. I um, actually have gotten one response already. Somebody wrote to me and it was a guild member who's in Australia who really wanted to join, but he said it's the middle of the night for him. Um, so perhaps at some point in the future, we can do a series 
um, in another time zone. And that brings up a point I want to mention is that the videos are not going to be recorded. It's only going to be live. Um, one of the reasons for that is I want people to feel absolutely free to make mistakes. I have a saying in um, part of my pedagogical philosophy is if you don't make mistakes, it only means you're not trying hard enough. That's, that's a um, great philosophy. So, but at some point in the future, perhaps we can do something like this and record it and perhaps in another time zone. But for our first pilot project, it'll be live. Yeah, I'm sorry. I, I remember I just uh, I just had a had a phone conversation with my friend in Tokyo. And it's just so difficult to coordinate with all of our friends in that particular region of the world because of the it's like 11, 12, 13. So it's so difficult to coordinate that. Um, unless you get up really, really early or stay up really late. And so um, I know I, I have a great love for that region because it's very mysterious to me. Um, we've got a, a number of Kiwis, Aussies, and uh, I just talked about Filipino a couple of weeks ago uh, as well. Um, so I, it, I'm sorry that you get forgotten sometimes or you get not accommodated sometimes because it's just difficult for us over way over here on the Western Hemisphere. So, um, but Stay tuned. God willing, we can we can do something more in the future. So, uh, well, I'm I'm excited. So I'll be I'll I'll see you and anyone else who joins up on uh, this Saturday, 11 a.m. Um, once again, you can join the guild to get access. Meaningofcatholic.com slash register. If you're not a guild member, the guild is an international online community of Catholics working together against the Marxists is what it is. And this is just one factor uh of of lay people helping each other learn latin continue or sharpen our latin so we can pass down that latin to our children and uh preserve the faith and so i'm really excited about this um so uh meaning of catholic.com slash register so dr bryson thanks so much any final thoughts uh comments about the latin study group um, I'm excited to have people join. Um, if you're interested, give it a try. Um, you don't, even if your schedule is such that you can't make it to every session, you're still welcome. Um, and there will be links to join not only in the show notes and at the Meaning of Catholic website, but also at the Telegram channel for Meaning of Catholic. And there's now a Telegram channel for the Latin Study Group where I'll also be posting um, word of the day, resources for learning more Latin that are related to what we'll be looking at in the group. Fantastic. So you just click the link below, click on join study group, and then you just put in your email and your information. So we'll get your email and then we can contact you. And so you you will hear from Dr. Bryson and get the link to the, the meeting this Saturday. And uh, we will see you there. So with that, Let's pray an Ave Maria, and we will invoke our uh, our lay saints for this lay apostolate um, as well, and uh, offer it all up to Almighty God, ultimately for His greater glory. Let's pray. Nomine Patris et Filii et Spiritus Sancti. Amen. Ave Maria, gratia plena, Dominus tecum, benedicta tu in mulieribus, et benedictus fructus ventris tui, Jesus. Sancta Maria, Mater Dei, ora pro nobis peccatoribus, nunc et in ora mortis nostre. Amen. Our Lady of Victory. Pray for us. Mary, Queen of the Home. Pray for us. Saint Joseph, Terror of Demons. Pray for us. Saint Anthony of the Desert, pray for all clergy and seminarians. In nomine Patris, et Filii, et Spiritus Sancti. Amen. Amen.